Hey guys, I have here a 48 volt, 100 amp hour lithium iron phosphate rack mount battery from SOK. This is their new budget friendly version that features a slimmed down BMS. You'll see there is no display or communications ports here on the front. We'll be doing a detailed review of this battery inside and out. We'll see how it performs and what the differences are from the original version. This battery measures 17 and 3 eighths inch in width, not counting the ears. It measures 19 and 1 half inches in depth and it measures just 7 inches in height. And that height is designed to fit in four rack units of a standard server or telecom sized rack. Additionally, it weighs in at 97 pounds. On the front of the battery, we have one positive and one negative terminal. We have an 80 amp DC rated Chint brand circuit breaker. We have some specifications of our battery. This is 51.2 volts nominal. That makes it a 16 S or 16 cells in series battery. Our maximum continuous charge and discharge is 80 amps. Now those amperage ratings do contradict what is published on the specification sheet. So I did ask Current Connected for clarification and they explained that the specification sheet was the original design target. I think that said 75 discharge and 50 charge and that the specifications printed on the battery of 80 amps charge and discharge continuous are the correct specifications for the battery. At the bottom, we have a serial number and a very small reset button, which can be pressed with a paperclip or other pointy object. This battery also came with a set of rack gears for the left and the right. We have two M8 bolts for the front terminal posts along with some rubberized uh, safety covers for those bolts and your lugs. And we have a small bag of hardware here which includes the cage nuts and bolts for the rack along with these screws for affixing the ears to the side of the battery. Lastly, we have our battery inspection report which is pretty much the same as the original battery comes with. So the original factory state of charge was 54%. They tested at 106 amp hours. Obviously the LCD is going to be a no since there is no LCD, there's no communication and they double checked the things that are packed with it and we can see it was QC passed and what is that April 28th of 2023. I did run a capacity test of this battery. I used the same standard testing procedure I used for most of these batteries. The battery was charged up using an Ames 48 volt lithium iron phosphate rated battery charger then connected to this 48 volt inverter through a Batrium shunt. This is part of the Batrium BMS package. For discharging the battery, I simply connected the charger to another battery bank through this inverter. It discharged around 1300 watts and you can see the resulting capacity is 105.47 amp hours, which is pretty darn close to the 106.05 amp hours as noted by SOK when they tested the battery. The underside of this lid has a very large piece of epoxy board for insulation between the batteries and the steel cover. And here is the initial look at the inside of this battery. This is always my favorite part of these teardowns, especially with these larger batteries, is just the cleanness and the, the it, they're really laid out quite beautifully in how this is designed, so. And this is very similar to their original battery, but I'm already spotting some differences. So let's take a closer look and see what those are. These are GFB brand cells. They are 3.2 volts, 100 amp hours. Model number 0ALCBA0910000D. And I consider these to be fairly standard cells at this point because we're starting to see them in a lot of these batteries. These are the same cells used in pretty much all of the SOK batteries. Uh, so we can see the M6 bolt here used to secure the bus bar down. And these are flexible bus bars. So you can see it's copper in the center there. And then it's got a layer of nickel on both sides uh, to prevent direct contact of the copper in the bus bar with the aluminum post of the cell. And you can see they are flexible bus bars. That means if the cell were to expand and contract either naturally or during a time of failure, uh, the bus bar can give a little bit. There you go because it's comprised of several layers of material. And that just helps reduce the amount of stress or force exerted on the actual posts of the battery. Those leads are routed very nicely up the center of these steel channels, which are also holding the battery in place. The wires are zip tied in place and they appear to be high quality wires. One thing I look for when you're zip tying wires like this is sometimes these companies use wire with very soft insulation and it can be easily damaged, especially when you are zip tying it. This wiring feels fairly tough, almost like it's MTW or machine wire, though I don't see that noted anywhere on it. Uh, additionally, on the far left here, we can see one temperature sensor. And then we also have a second temperature sensor up here on the far right. So there are two temperature sensors total on the battery portion of this battery. There is an additional third one on the BMS itself. Taking a look at the left-hand side here, we have our main positive and our main negative conductor. They are comprised of seven gauge silicone insulated wire that has a 200 degrees Celsius insulation rating. The positive conductor is coming down and is going into the circuit breaker down in there. It then exits the circuit breaker and simply comes up to the positive terminal of the battery. 
Additionally, we have the smaller red wire, this positive wire coming off, and that's going down to supply positive to the BMS for the BMS working voltage. So here's a close-up look at the BMS, and from what I understand, SOK actually designs their own BMSs. They're not simply slapping in another brand's or another company's BMS. So at the top here, I do see the part number is SOK-BMS-16S-V3, and this is a massive heatsink they have on here. Look at the thickness of that aluminum. It's just, it's huge. Um, so that's going to be able to absorb quite a bit of heat, I think. I don't know that it would dissipate it as well as a finned heatsink design. Uh, we do see the main negative comes into the B minus of the BMS here. Uh, and then from the P minus here, it exits the BMS. And we can see it goes down to the main negative terminal. So these two leads coming in on the top here are going to be the two temperature sensors. Down here we have the main balance leads coming in. It's a nicely bundled harness. So I'm gonna go ahead and disconnect all of these balance leads before we proceed any further. And when disconnecting these balance leads, you should always start with the leads of the higher potential. Uh, that is the highest positive lead over here. So we're going to pull this connector off first, and then we can pull off the rightmost connector. So down here we have a nicely laid out array of resistors, tiny transistors and diodes, and there's some additional resistors back there. This area is going to be for the passive balancing. So if the BMS determines that one or more of the cells are over voltage or need to balance, these transistors will turn on and bleed off some of the power stored in the cells through these resistors. And then we have this small blue circuit board up here that's going to be our Bluetooth module. This battery does have Bluetooth capability. It's very basic monitoring support, so you can check the voltage of your cells, the temperatures, and any fault conditions. Now this battery is somewhat unique in that it's designed with serviceability in mind. You know, replacing the BMS or replacing a cell, things of that nature. Now when I do these videos, I typically don't recommend opening up and disassembling your batteries because obviously there are safety concerns involved. I am going to show you how this battery can be taken apart. Uh, but if you're going to do so, I strongly recommend you do so with the manufacturer's advice um, and you read and understand their warranty and safety procedures. So the first thing I did was I loosened both of the bolts on the series connecting piece here that connects these two battery packs together. Now I backed them almost the entire way off, but not the entire way. And I'm removing this piece first because that's going to immediately cut the maximum voltage of this battery in half making it a little bit more safer to work on since we are talking about a lower voltage. Now the reason why I didn't take them the whole way out is because uh, you don't want to remove one bolt and then while you're loosening the other have this bar swing around and make contact one of these two points causing a short circuit. So I always loosen them up to the point where they're almost out but not quite the whole way and then you can very easily pick them up without having to worry about that bar moving. Now we can safely pick up this connector and move it aside. There are four screws securing this battery pack into place. There's two on the left, and there are two over here on the right. Now with those screws being removed, this whole battery pack should, oh yeah, there it goes, slides right out. Being very careful not to pinch any of these wires anywhere. Next on the top of the battery here, I removed all of the bolts that were holding down uh, the ring terminals for the balance leads. And then next, there are three Phillips screws on each side of the battery on the bottom. You can see there are three here on the right-hand side, and there are three more on the left-hand side. Now, once all of those screws are removed, you should be able to very carefully lift this top piece off. Keeping in mind, this entire frame is metal and you have a lot of battery exposed contacts up here. So you do not want this frame in any way to come in contact with the battery contacts. So we can take out our bolts here slide off our end plate, and then we can simply slide out our cells. Look at that. It's that easy, and this is a brand new, perfect, pristine cell. I don't see any forms of defects or bloating or anything. And here is the rigid steel frame they have this built on, and we can also see the plastic separator pieces that go between each cell. So it does uh, hold the cells firmly fixed in place, but it does still allow a bit of area to expand and contract, though I imagine that's going to be very minimal based on that plastic between them. That's it. That's how easy it is to disassemble this battery if you need to replace components. I think it's very, very unlikely you'll ever have to replace a cell. If anything, uh, you may have to replace a BMS. And now it's time to get it put back together. So the last test we're going to do here is the low temperature charge protection test. I have one of the temperature sensors pulled off Going to spray it a little bit with a can of compressed air, which should drop it well below freezing. And we should see the charge current drop to zero here on the clamp meter. So we are charging at 8.32 amps.
All right, and now we're down to zero and that was about four to five seconds. So now I'm going to warm it back up here and just make sure charging resumes as we would expect. All right, and there we go, we're charging again. And that took about 11 seconds to get charging back on. There are a few key differences to note between this battery, the budget-friendly version, and their original battery, the slightly more expensive version. First off, this battery doesn't have any safety certifications or testing. They don't plan to do any sort of testing. The original battery carries a UL1973 certification as tested by ETL. Second, this battery does not have any pre-charge circuit or pre-charge functionality. That means when you go to connect to your inverter or your charger for the first time, you may need to apply a resistor or other smaller load in series with the battery to pre-charge the capacitors in your inverter. If you choose not to do that, you do risk damaging the battery and or damaging your inverter. Third, and probably the most obvious, is this battery does not have any communications ports or an LCD display screen. There are benefits to setting up the closed loop communication between your batteries and your inverters, but it certainly is not a requirement. Lastly, this battery is rated for 80 amps continuous charge and discharge, where their original is rated for 100 amps charge and discharge. Now there is one thing I don't like about this battery. This battery ships with the BMS in a sleep state or a somewhat shutdown state. Now that's actually a positive thing because that means the BMS won't be draining down your battery while it's in storage at the warehouse, while it's in shipment, and while it's sitting at your house once it's delivered before you install it. The problem with that is that there's no way to wake up this BMS with what you have here on this battery. Turning the circuit breaker on does not start up the BMS. There is the reset pinhole down here, which does not start up the BMS. The only way to start up this battery for the first time is to apply 48 volts to the positive and negative terminal. And that becomes problematic because most chargers and most inverters will not turn on and begin charging your battery unless they sense power at the terminals. So there are a few ways to do this. You could use a bench power supply to start it up. You could get a 48 volt transformer charger from some other device that happens to be 48 volts and connect it momentarily just enough time to start it up. You could, uh, I know, I heard Victron sells a 48 volt charger that does not require voltage present to begin charging. You know, that's an option as well. But all of those items require purchasing additional accessories to simply use the battery that you've already purchased. What I ended up doing is I took the cover off the battery and I jumped the negative terminal on the front to the negative pole of the battery inside. What that does is it bypasses the BMS it's essentially connecting the P minus and the B minus very momentarily. Now, if you're going to use that approach, I would certainly apply a resistor in line, you know, just in case there's some sort of fault. But I did make the recommendation to them to add a second button of some sort on here that you simply need to press that would apply a high resistance resistor to the negative pole. All it needs to do is see that voltage to turn on the BMS. I did make that suggestion to Current Connected and they said they'll take it back to SOK and maybe see if they can get this reset button to do something similar, but... So lastly, let's talk about pricing. This battery sells for $1,299, making it the cheapest option I could find anywhere online if you're going to buy a full rack of five batteries, you know, a full rack setup. That price does not include shipping, so if you're only going to buy one battery, there may be some cheaper options out there. Now I'm going to look at my cheat sheet here to make sure I get this right. I added five of these batteries to my cart and the total came to $6,945, which is $1,389 per battery, including the shipping cost. And that price also includes the free five slot rack for installing your batteries. Now I checked around and even with the current promotions, none of the batteries we have reviewed thus far can beat the price of this battery shipping included. If you know of one I'm missing, please do let me know. I will include links to this battery down in the video description. If you're going to purchase one, please do use that link. It does help support this channel. I did purchase this battery myself at full price solely for the purposes of this review. This video was not sponsored. If you have any questions or comments or want to share your experience, please leave those down in the comment section. Hit that like button before you go, and thanks for watching.